doing doctoral research was interviewing me recently and, and asking a lot of interesting questions. And one of them was, what do you really like about your job? And like many of you, I've had some other jobs before I worked uh, with students. And uh, one of my jobs was working in a big law firm where I reviewed documents all day long and working with them in the office getting windows. And it was called the trial department, but most of the departments in the law firm had never had a trial. So it was, it was a really boring practice. And I can remember leaving thinking that if that building was gone the next day, would the world be a better or a worse place? I wasn't at all sure. And one of the great things about what we do is that every day, on the best day or on the worst day, we know the answer to that question because what we're doing is making the lives better for other people. So one of the themes today is telling the story of Cabrillo and thinking about what our story is going to be for the spring of 2011. And a couple of quick student stories that many of you have heard before. How many of you worked with this girl? Yolanda Inchari, this is when she first came to the United States in junior high, probably about seventh grade. And my daughter Celia is in sixth grade now, and we're thinking about middle school and all the changes that will go on and meeting new friends. And then you compound that with coming from another country and not speaking the language and how difficult that is for students like Yolanda. And uh, Yolanda got involved in the Cabrillo Advancement Program, and uh, that helped her very much get ready for college. And then she came to Cabrillo, not directly at one point, she actually served in the U.S. military as part of the path to citizenship for Yolanda in the United States. She came back to Cabrillo as a student leader, did a phenomenal job in our second harvest food drive, helping us be one of the, the best organizations in raising food for the hungry. And then last spring, she sent me this photo uh, after transferring to San Diego State University. She was one of their outstanding graduates. So that is certainly one of the great stories about Rio. And I, I take Yolanda with me in talking to groups uh, through, not, not physically, she's uh, doing a lot of other things, but through the story and through the photograph so you can see the transformation that happens when students come to Rio. How many of you were involved with uh, Coulter White when he was here at Cabrillo? I mean, you know Coulter's story, that uh, really tough story that he had been, spent time in Pelican Bay and the toughest prisons in California, and was certainly at a point where it looked like he might spend the rest of his life there. But when he was out, he came to Cabrillo and got involved and got very active in our honor society. He was a good student here. And uh, then at a time, when he was falsely accused of a parole violation, many of you in this room were very involved in making sure that Coulter didn't go back to prison. And now he's at Santa Clara University this fall. I had lunch with Coulter a couple weeks ago. And uh, Coulter's story is continuing because going from Pelican Bay to Cabrillo to Santa Clara, obviously a lot of transitions happen along the way. Many of them are not easy. So one of the things I wanted to do this morning, uh, well, another student, uh, a real student who was in the news fairly recently, how many of you had Dwight Lowry in a class or a kid in some ways? A kid from SoCal that uh, came to Cabrillo and played football and then uh, went to San Jose State University where he was an All-American, then drafted in the NFL and played for the New York Jets. And in their playoff game when he started, one of the things that all the players do in the three game introductions is say where they went to school. Anybody see Dwight's introduction? What did he say? Cabrillo. He said Cabrillo College, he didn't say San Jose State, so I'm asking you. Another one of our success stories was, uh, and I think in a very significant way, acknowledging what Cabrillo meant to him. And I don't want to get into it of taking sides on the Super Bowl, but next weekend. Green Bay. Green Bay. Where did the quarterback for the uh, Packers start for college? You. You. So Aaron Rodgers started at New College and then went on to Berkeley, and he's done the same thing in introduction. Sometimes he'll say New College, and no offense to you there, he'll say New College instead of Cal at times. So a lot of our students, you and Berkeley is known for Cabrillo and South East Okay, and your false point, you say Cabrillo you would choose over San Jose State, you over uh, Berkeley. Cabrillo and South East State over Berkeley. There you go. Okay. <laughs> So it's very important as we enter a, a challenging year and a challenging semester to remember and tell the Cabrillo story. And we need to be telling the story to each other. We need to be reminding one another in tough times why we're doing what we're doing. And also I want some help from you 
and sharing your student success stories. And what I want to do, the way we're set up right now, if you'll just pair off with someone next to you and share a story of uh, a real success, one another. We've got a chance to take just a minute and talk to the person next to you and share a story about a student that when you think about what the real does, who comes to mind? Just take a minute and talk to each other. Things like unprecedented, but it probably is 
the first time uh, in our history that we're looking at the kind of cuts that Governor Brown is talking about. Budget unknowns. Not only is the news bad, there are all these variables that we'll talk about, and we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the budget today, but we don't know whether the governor will be able to get tax increases on the ballot. Okay, that's a big decision-making point. If tax increases or extensions are on the ballot, we won't know until June if they'll pass. If they don't pass, we don't know what the budget will look like then. So can we wait to solve the budget, to plan for the budget until everything is known? It'll, it'll be too late, so we're going to have to strike that balance on working through the fiscal crisis when there are a lot of things that we don't know and a lot of things we can't know, so we'll have to be nimble and flexible and prepared for a lot of different options. Pressure for results. We're going to talk a lot about some of the national movements and concerns about having outcomes for our students that are better than they are. Going back to that idea that a lot of the layoffs are uh, jobs that are not going to come back. In other cycles, people would wait out the bottom and the factory would reopen again. A lot of evidence that's not happening now. Mortgages and bills. How many of you, like me, have a variable rate mortgage? So over here, you, know, you sit around waiting and don't know how much you're going to be paying for your house in the last couple of years. That's been okay. Rates have gone down. I am going to boldly, if Paul, you can back me up on this, rates are not going to go down forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, in planning for the budget this semester, this Friday, there will be two opportunities to come to a budget town hall meeting. And Victoria, others who are involved, did I get the place and time right? One of the most difficult things to do in all the planning is to get the right room, the right day, and the right time. It is Friday. It is 4 or 4.50. The first is at 10.30 in the morning. Many faculty will be in the vision meeting, so we scheduled a second one at 2 o'clock when the bulk of activities for the day on the schedule were complete. So if you can't attend one of those two meetings, also check the budget information website on uh, the group, the real website that will be filled with all the latest information as well. This Friday? This Friday, at the end of this week. So the uh, Career College Governing Board, and I want to introduce Rebecca Garcia, who's here today representing the board. Welcome. To the a week from today, at 5 o'clock at the regular meeting time in the Cessna House on uh, Monday, February 7th, we'll have the regular meeting, and part of that will be the board reviewing the latest information from Sacramento and some of the budget parameters, and then a special board budget study session on February 15th at 4 p.m. and uh, I believe that's in the Cessna House as well? Yes. Yes, Dominique says yes. So, it's February, a week from today and two weeks from today, public opportunities to for the board to be discussing what's going on with the budget. So the students is the focus and telling our students stories and not being distracted and pulled away from why we're all here when we're going through really tough discussions about the budget as well. Those shouldn't be two separate discussions. When we're making decisions on what to do with our resources, we need to be thinking about how those decisions are going to affect the men and women who return to our campus. So Paul jumped ahead of the program. Are our students ready to succeed? Nine out of 10 first time students need preparatory work to become ready to take and complete college level math. So when you, we're asked the question, and we're not unusual, we're, we're not unlike most of the 112 uh, California community colleges, our students are not arriving on our doorstep ready to do college level work. Surprise? How many of you find that surprising? <laughs> How many of you find it discouraging? <laughs> How do we even know that's true? Big for itself. I'm here. Please welcome on in. Well, no time, yeah.
talk about when students come for the assessment. Okay. Um, they, they come to do math or English or both. Typically, they'll do both. And it is a timed assessment on a computer terminal, which does present some problems for some students. They don't like doing it on the computer. Um, they don't have a lot of computer experience. And sometimes that might also affect their outcome. So they'll come back after they kind of get used to it. Um, so it's, like I said, it's timed. And they're in a room full of people, typically 55 students in a room, taking this assessment all at the same time. And um, the, count, the clock is counting down um, on each individual one. So you've also got students that are going faster than other students. And so it's a kind of a whirlwind. You took it all by yourself. But can you imagine that room full of 55 people that are kind of all doing the same and almost everyone in here has taken that kind of test at some point in your life where you have everybody around and you're wondering how the people next to you are doing. And, uh, and typically what we find is that the students that are coming right out of high school have no problem at all in that environment. But the students that are coming back to school, they haven't been in school for a while, they're coming because they, they want to get retraining and all that, those are the students that have a problem or a challenge being in that kind of environment. It's so unfamiliar to them. Um, they, and they may not do as well as we would want them to do or know they can do, so they get another opportunity. They can take that assessment again to try and get into the level that, that is correct for them. So that's the whole goal, is to get a student into the right level before they get there and realize it's either too easy or too hard. So we don't want to waste their time and our time and all of that. How many assessments in a year? How, how, many, how many would you give? How many sessions? How many? How many students, students do we test? Yeah, how many students? Roughly 5,000. Okay. Now, not all of our students are assessed. So there's, that, that's a good topic for discussion. And we're, Steve, Steve Hodges and the faculty senate are going to be talking about a lot of student success issues. Assessment is a good topic for the senate and faculty to be embracing and saying, and look at, are our assessments the right measure? Are there uh, other instruments that we can consider <coughs> using? And, and a heads up at the statewide level, there is a lot of inertia to encouraging colleges to use an assessment instrument that would conceivably be free, with the idea being that the Chancellor's Office would like consistent assessment data around the state. Michael? Just a question on, on the nature of the test. Are there multiple choice on yes. math and English? Yes. So there's no writing on the English? <coughs> no writing. Okay. There used to be a writing sample many years ago, but those of you in the English department can help me with this. Was it because we did away with it because money, money, right? <laughs> yeah, that's very intensive. It's because yes. you have to pay people to pay for it, and it takes much longer to get those results back and get the student placed. Should have writing though. What would be the right assessment? I would encourage you, if you're an English, to take the English assessments. And, uh, I, I have to say, it was hard. The English assessment was difficult. And there were a lot of questions where two of them were obviously wrong and two of them were right and which was better. Now, I do want to say in all modesty, and, and maybe for relief to you, I did test in the English composition. I would not need remedial work in English and I'm at with another question. Uh, just writing off Michael's question, uh, do all those tests have they got reliability and validity coefficients? Number one. And number two, what happens if they fail the assessment? There's no failing. Oh well then it's not a test really. <laughs> It's a place. You're right. It's not a test. <laughs> You're right. It is an assessment so that we know what, or so that they know what their skills are, no, and that we know where they're going to go into. And there's no failing, but if you feel pretty good about your math and English and get placed in two developmental levels below college, it doesn't feel like a success. No. So this is a pretty important process for getting our students in the right place. And as faculty members, you don't want students in your class who are completely unprepared to do the work that you expect them to do. My question has to do with the technology and for some students who are not used to using computers. Do you always have an option for them to put in? Yes. We encourage them, though. We try and use it. Well, we could even set up a separate appointment with them on the computer to see 
just guiding them through because it's pretty easy once they get a little mouth tutorial and all of that, but if that's still too much, we can do a paper pencil version. It's the same. So when a student arrives and it's clear that they're going to waste a lot of time just getting that point there or whatever sure. it is, you then intervene and offer yeah. them this option. It has to be at a separate time because once we get going, we can't put them back into it. Then you do a separate class. Yeah, but we do is uh, with them. Great. Yeah. One or two other quick questions, and then Anya needs to go back and oh, get assessment pretty yeah. soon. <laughs> Any other quick questions? Yes. Well, that was, and you brought it up just now. Um, is it clear to those students that are not computer literate or who prefer not to scroll back and forth using the mouse that they will be able to ask for, at the get go, right at the beginning of the exam, they get a printed copy? I'm sorry. Can, can the students uh, opt to have a printed copy right from the get-go? Can they say, okay, we want a printed copy of this No, exam? because the timing mechanism is different. When they do it on the computer, it's, it's self-timed within the, the testing program. But if we do a paper pencil, it's a manual timer. And so we, we can't, we have to take them out of the testing environment, the computerized one, and give them an appointment to do that. Okay, so assessment. Pretty interesting topic that you might not have thought about being an interesting topic. As far as how do we know whether our students are prepared or not, the measurement is our assessment test. Really interesting things going on at colleges around the country that I think are worth talking about. It, does it make sense for high school students who have not had math maybe for their senior year? Not uncommon for students to finish their math in their junior year and kind of skate the senior year. Well, you forget, you know, for me it's been 30 years since I had college algebra. I don't remember very much. Does it make sense to have a uh, refresher boot camp courses for students so they can be placed where they should be instead of there where they would be after uh, taking a test when they haven't reviewed the material? A lot of opportunities for discussion about what we could do for students to make sure that the assessment is meaningful. Should assessment be mandatory is another question that's very interesting. And then a related question working through the state faculty senate, our faculty senate, is prerequisites in California community colleges. Are prerequisites a way to help better place students to be successful? And uh, a lot of discussion going on statewide about that. Let's thank Anya. <laughs> so once they're assessed and enrolled, you still have to pay for it. And Judy from Financial Aid is going to join us now. Thank you very much. Let's give Judy a round of applause. Yeah. Now, 
I've taught in the classroom, and the hours are precious, aren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have subject matter you have to cover, and I try to learn everybody's name in day one, and by the end of day one, get into the subject matter. So there are a lot of pressures on, on your classroom time. But I would strongly encourage everyone in the classroom to take a minute or two, first day of class, and ask two questions. How many of you have applied for financial aid? See how many raise their hands. And they then ask, how many of you have filled out the FAFSA form, which is the federal application for free student aid? For free student aid. Because what happens too many times is students will apply for the Board of Governors waiver, the BOG waiver, and if they qualify, then they don't have to pay their fees. Now, fees are going up, and it would be nice if fees are free, but still, what is the total cost of attendance at California Community College and just fees alone? It's still quite low. Books, transportation, housing, it's all the other costs that are really killers. So way too many of our students qualify for a bog waiver and then they stop. So ask your students, have you filled out the federal aid? It's actually federal free application. application. The free FAFSA. Application. Whatever it's <laughs> yeah. is to qualify for a Pell Grant. And a Pell Grant is not a loan. When students qualify for a Pell Grant, they don't have to pay it back. Correct. So we're leaving money on the table for our students. So if your students say, yeah, I've applied for aid, but haven't applied for federal financial aid, take a minute and say, do it now, apply, it's free money. And if you are able to qualify for a Pell Grant, you may have to work fewer hours, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about all the things that are good about financial aid, allowing students to attend full-time. Full-time correlates very well with graduating and, uh, and working correlates very poorly with how students do. Is there a link on the Korea Financial Aid website right to the FAFSA? Yes. The FAFSA? Yes. Thank you. Um, Why would a student be denied financial aid? Um, the only reason that they would be denied, well, two reasons. Um, if their income is too high, whether it's theirs or their parents, until you're 24, you're under your parents. Unless you have a child, you're a veteran, um, you're married. So if, if your income is too high, that wouldn't work for you. And then if we, we do monitor um, academic progress. So if you're suspended, you have to sit out and either appeal or sit out a semester without aid and then ask for reinstatement after you do well. Okay. If you're a legal resident but not a citizen, then you're eligible. You are. Yeah. If you have an A number. Right, right. Okay, and Ophelia makes another point. If students are not legal residents, they're hesitant to, to apply and would not qualify right. for federal financial aid. However, we do have scholarships, and I'm also the scholarship coordinator in the office. So I have a list Great, of scholarships you. for students who don't have an immigration status. That David? We I'm sorry, is it David and Lenny? I assume that when they come to your door, you tell them about the federal event right away. Right? Absolutely. Some interesting policy issues in California. The, the BOG waiver, how many times can you qualify for a BOG waiver? There's no limit on the BOG waiver. What grades do you have to have to keep getting a bond waiver? It doesn't matter. You can flunk every course for 20 years and come back and call it a bond waiver. So there's, there's some interesting policy discussions. And if I had a magic wand, which I don't, I would require every student to fill out the bachelor form as part of their application process. Now, there are ways to get does that sound like a good idea? Yes. Absolutely. So we need to work together to find ways to make it, you know, in effect mandatory for students to follow the fashion form so that they can get the money they're entitled to and all the good things that go with that. Any other questions? So with the financial aid forms, does the student have to have filled out on previous year's taxes? Well, um, it's a little bit complicated. In a right. time like today, you're in, in between two years. So we're doing still the MLM year, which is for the spring and the summer. And then we're also doing the 11, 12 year, which is for next fall through summer. For the next year, you can you can guess. There's an option on the FAFSA that says will file, and the federal government understands that nobody's filed yet. So you can put an estimate of last year to <coughs> some arbitrary number that you pick from the sky until we get to the process where we check on it. As of right now, it won't let you choose that option for this year's FAFSA. So it does want either I have not filed, you know, I will file, but it won't let you do that, or I did file. Um, also, this is kind of important. I don't know that you guys would see this, but um, we do do income changes as well. So if you see a student in your class and they didn't, they applied for a class and they didn't get anything because they were working some, you know, great job making $60,000 last year and they're laid off, 
they can come in and talk to us and we can then say, I know I made this on paper last year, but this is really what's going on for me now. And we can kind of wipe out all of that income and show what's really happening for them to get them the financial aid. Question. I'm sorry, just to clarify. Just to So they're not, they're not going to pay the rent. That's kind of what I want. 
it's a wonderful right. opportunity. There's also additional you know, scholarships and student loans, loans, loans right there, and I just can't do that. But it's not. <coughs> we try to let them know, you know, that financial aid is not for paying your your rent, is not for making sure that your bills are paid, it is for for school and for the things that are needed for school books, you know, supplies, car insurance to make sure that you can get here and <coughs> stuff like that. But when they come to us and say, I can't pay my rent, you know, we say that's why you need to plan. But if if um if that's the case, if they are quitting their job voluntarily, there's no reason that we can't do an income change in that situation. We do understand that's what's <coughs> happening along now. So is there a list a sheet with the grants and scholarships, et cetera, that are available that students can apply for? Because I would like to hand those out. Um, you know, I could make sure that we got a, a piece of paper out. We kind of don't have very much paper anymore. Well, but I, Dennis, and you, could you do to all faculty sort of the summary with the, the link that uh, Nikki was asking Absolutely. about? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's thank Tootie. She needs to do that. I guess this will be the, the first announcement. On February 26th, um, Cabrillo is going to host a financial aid day, part of a national program um, called College Goal, as well as Cash for College. And on that day, we are going to invite the entire community, to, no matter where they're going to school, to come to Cabrillo, and we will help them fill out their FAFSA forms. So, but we're inviting you to also volunteer for that day. We'll have some training sessions on teach you how to fill out the FAFSA form so that you can help other people fill it out. To be honest with you, we're all old. If we remember when I filled out the FAFSA, it was really difficult. It's much easier now, it's electronic. So we're hoping that when you see the announcement inviting you to volunteer, that you'll volunteer for Saturday from nine to four on the 26th to come in and help our community fill out the FAFSA form. And that date will be in the email that goes out that Correct. has the link to the FAFSA application on the website and an overview of scholarships, which is a good segue. And I know Melinda Silverstein is here, and, and everyone who's been involved in the Women's Educational Success Program, can you stand up? We have several counselors. <laughs> Melinda, do you want to share a little bit about the history of those years? The Women's Educational Success started about 13 years ago with a couple of women, Rachel Spencer, our trustee, and Katie Downs Baskin, thinking of women just gave $100 and 100 women gave that amount, we would have a fund to help particularly re-entry women at Cabrillo. And every year they have a luncheon that generates about 70000 and now we have an endowment that's about 600000 So every year we have $30,000 to give for emergency grants, uh, sometimes around the 500 level. And out in Cabrillo we have 17 women's educational success advisors. And those are staff and faculty who are you know, running across women who need to have a book or child care, and they put in a fax to the foundation. Within um, about two days, they get a check to help them on their path to stay in school. Thanks, Melinda. So the WS program established by women to help women. We're also talking about a student emergency loan fund program that would be available to all students. But the WS program is another. We talked about the Cabrillo Advancement Program that Yolanda went through funded through the foundation and private donations, the WES program. Many of our scholarships are made possible by the generosity of private individuals and foundations around our community. I'm sorry, did you say there's an emergency loan? We're, we're developing the concept of an emergency loan, but it's not available no. yet, right? That would be available to all students, even those with a white chromosome. <laughs> WES is women helping them. Okay. Another way to approach it, yes? Since there's women helping women, how about men helping men? <laughs> 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 the comment was, why not men helping men? And Alex said, we don't do that so much. <laughs> <laughs> Another way to address the preparedness issue, really important efforts on, on uh, preparedness for high school students, is this idea of reaching back to our high school. And Wanda is here today, Dean Wanda Garner. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening on March 30th with the PBUSD? Well, I think we're still developing the agenda, but the English faculty and math faculty, from time to time, get together with high school, with their high school uh, compadres, and discuss 
how our forces do or do not sync up and what their goals are and, and what ours are. And of course, our goals are heavily driven by our transfer requirements. But the high schools have, are dealing with uh, testing requirements and various other things that they're trying to meet. And so we don't always have exactly the same content or exactly the same focus. And so it's from time to time we try to get together and discuss that and see how we can link up better or mesh better. Um, at least understand what each other is doing and, and try to figure a way to bridge the gap, so to speak. Okay. So those sort of, sort of partnerships on articulation of curriculum with high schools and Cabrillo are really important. How many of you saw the Sentinel today, the front page story on Santa Cruz City Schools? where same sort of emphasis on college preparedness for students and emphasizing in the, the vernacular, the A through G curriculum, the requirements for California State University and, and University of California. <coughs> also, the big misperception in the community, and we hear this all the time, that, well, you know, I wanted to go to UC or I wanted to go to CSU, but I can always go to Cabrillo. And the translation is, in the minds of students, we need to, to change this mindset that, yeah, Cabrillo's open admission, I can not prepare at all and still go to Cabrillo, which is true. <laughs> you can still go to Cabrillo, and what will happen when you do with that mindset? You won't complete, you'll, you'll, you'll flunk out Cabrillo. Not a good use of the student's time, not a good use of finite resources and shrinking budget times for the college. So that kind of effort that Wanda and Marjorie and Jim Wickler and, and many of the faculty are involved in are very, very important to be having conversations with high school faculty members about here's what we need for students to be prepared. And also, emphasize to your students that preparing for Cabrillo is just like preparing for CSU or UC. You need that same level of preparedness. Yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking about when I read that article. Mm -hmm. that it starts with the public image. That article should have included, and you can do these transfer courses that you're preparing for. You can start it at Cabrillo, exactly what you said. So, you know, it, it's, we need to, somehow we need to educate the public, not just the high school. Sure. To get that message out. And one of the overarching themes today is telling the story of Cabrillo. And part of the story is, yeah, we're open admissions, but to be successful, you need to be prepared. And we are not that different than UC or CSU on what you need to do to be prepared. That we're here for you. Let's do it. I was going to say one way to educate the public is for us to write an editorial. Uh, let it be an ongoing thing. You don't have to do maybe every semester an editorial out there about what we do. And uh, that will help to shift the, perspective, the uh, perception of who we are. Yeah, the ongoing communication is a good suggestion letters to the editor. You get a certain demographic in the newspaper all the different groups we speak to. Friday, I'm speaking to Leadership Santa Cruz, and, uh, and I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna use some of the same slides that we're going over today in a minute about the importance of completion <coughs> and what it means to the economy. So, part of it is an ongoing communications message. Part of it, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on the budget, but if there are tax issues on the ballot, we want our community to, to understand what the impact of voting in favor of those would be. Because we have to, uh, the problem is uh, working to dispel the myth that Cabrillo College is just an extended high school mm -hmm. because it is not. This right. is a rigor. This is an institution of higher learning, and we are faculty who promote rigorous mm -hmm. and engaging I and stand. challenging curriculum. Uh, right. Couldn't agree more. You got to write that down.
three uh, educational institutions, the uh, CSUMB, um, Hartnell, and Embrya, to work together to cause, <coughs> to work together, I'm seeing back there telling me to uh, raise my voice, uh, uh, to work together to um, um, <coughs> make a, a process whereby our, our basic skills education prepares students better and um, in a consistent fashion for um, college level courses. So with that in mind, we uh, both went, uh, we got a group of English people and a group of math people together to, um, <clears throat> to focus on um, the courses that lead into college level courses for both English and math. Um, for it, math, it was the uh, intermediate algebra course, which leads into pre-calculus and statistics and um, some of the other transferable courses. For English, it was... Two by five and 100, the, the, the entry courses. So, so the, whole, the whole idea is to have um, the community colleges and the CSU working together to uh, address the issues of developmental and better prepare students by having a, a discussion. So not only what we do here at the <coughs> campus, but then um, have that conversation in the county and in between the community colleges and transfer institutions. So it's, it's kind of exciting and, and for me as on a personal uh, level and what we're doing in the English department is uh, most of the people who participated are part-timers and so it's really great because they get professional development. Um, we're during, during the year, we're uh, taking um, pilot lessons and we're teaching each other. So like, well, I'll do a pilot lesson and they're, they're, my team will come to my room and observe it. And then they'll do pilot lessons, I'll go to their room and observe it. And we're not like, it's not evaluation, it's more like how are we teaching, how to better our teaching and make it consistent, community college and the CSU level. And then uh, we're hoping to uh, uh, develop these lessons and put them in a book maybe. And so then for our part-timers to have a publication, to have conference experience, to have professional development for three years, it's, uh, it's really kind of neat. And on the math uh, <laughs> part of it, um, we, during the summer, we got together for five conferences, five meetings, um, where we uh, talked about what, what, what uh, problems, we, very specifically, what five problems we could use uh, to test students on a final exam in intermediate algebra. Not such an easy thing to do with three different institutions, <laughs> let alone one. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we actually agreed on five problems, and we uh, I brought it to our department as well. As Ed Hartnell brought those problems to their departments, and, um, and CSUMB, CSUMB also is doing the same thing. Um, so we're putting those problems on <clears throat> final exams. We, already, we did the first round this last semester, and we'll be doing one more. And we're taking the student responses from those uh, problems and bringing them to this coming summer's meetings, and we're going to create a rubric and talk about student responses to the problems and see where students are lacking and where they, uh, what we can do about it to improve success. And we, we wrote a, uh, <coughs> in the, they're working together, sometimes we work as English and math, and sometimes we work together as, as a whole group. I won't, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, we wrote a goal and principle, and, and what, what's nice about it is that um, I, I think education is better when we work together, right? When we talk, or when we're in dialogue. And so to have that in our campus is, is really Between great. Between math and English? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we actually know. I think I've got it. Which is awesome. <laughs> because our students aren't just taking English or math. And I've heard other faculty talk about that when they come together. You, we have the epiphany just because they're doing well in my class doesn't mean they're doing well in another class. And we need to be looking at the whole student. So we really appreciate your involvement. Do you, you want to go ahead and oh, share the, the just, point? Just one. Uh, we, we hope to understand how 21st century students achieve academic literacy as part of their collegiate journey. In particular, we're interested in studying how students become engaged in academic curriculum, how they participate in inquiry, how they use their out-of-school literacies for academic tasks, how they develop habits of mind, how these, how they develop portable skills, how they internalize procedural knowledge, and how they transfer learning from composition courses to new contexts and tasks. 
We are additionally interested in understanding how students relate to their academic community as a whole person and what leads to their motivation, persistence, and retention. And so we're talking about these things with each other and, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's great. It's, it's a good thing that we're doing. Yeah, transfer of learning is, is a big topic. And I noticed Ed had the handout from CSU and Do you know if that's on their website anymore? I haven't looked. That's a fairly new document. Yeah, it's brand new. That might be something that you could share with your colleagues right. on yeah. this program. That's good. That's good. Great. Yeah. Let's show our appreciation. Yeah. So assessment is important. Financial aid is important. And I want to emphasize that for faculty in particular, when we talk about improving student performance, sometimes it can feel like that it's a bunch of people who aren't teaching full time saying that you would just do your job better. So my emphasis today is that there is so much more to our students being successful than the important work in the classroom. That still is crucial, but the support services for students are also very important, starting with assessment, starting with financial aid so they're able to go to school full time as much as possible and not have to work as many hours outside. And also a lot of wonderful professional development programs for faculty, like the Faculty Experiential Learning Institute, of the Academy for College Excellence, formerly known as DBA, that's quite a mouthful, isn't it? But everybody stand up who's gone through the felony program. It's quite a large group. Thanks, guys. And on course is going on this week. How many of you have gone through on course? How many of you have gone through both felony and on course? Okay, several of you have. So I really appreciate the commitment to go through these professional development experiences that take up a block of time. In January, I went through the Felling program, and it's a week-long program that I would encourage any of you to have the opportunity to go through. And we're approaching about 100 uh, men and women at Cabrillo who have gone through the Felling. So one of our goals for this semester is to sort of leverage that through a community of practice from the shared experiences. And what we have to do to meet our student needs is pull the best from our different pilot programs and make those practices as widely shared as possible. And sometimes time is the biggest hurdle in doing that, that we're all so busy. Sharing what's going on can be, can be difficult. We mentioned the Lumina grant. We also have received uh, multi-million dollar grants from the Gates Foundation. The emphasis for both Lumina and Gates is about completion. And sometimes there's a sense that all that completion stuff is just an obsession with diplomas. How many of you have had some of those thoughts that we do so many more things, right? And let, let's just get that out of the way. What are things we do that aren't reflected in, uh, in degrees and certificates? Empowerment of the individual. Individual empowerment, transformed lives. OK, what else? Shifting perspectives. Shifting perspectives. Learning. Learning. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? You know, life? Mark? Um, success. Defining success with a diploma real, um, or a degree bothers me a lot because I see lots of other kinds of successes for my students. Staying there for one semester, completing a class. Um, there are lots of other measures of success yeah. besides. And let's take a look at this clip that maybe share, may, may represent some of the perspectives some of you have on the overemphasis on a degree being magical. Why anybody can have a brain is <laughs> such a very easy question. I can use the animal speech that crawls on the earth or slinks through slimy seas. As a brain, back where I come from, we have university seats. So brains learn to be
that has provided the grants that we've talked about. And also the gates are very uh, focused on what they call the big goal. The language is a little different for gates, but the idea is the same. To increase the proportion of Americans with high quality degrees, to define what that means, a high quality degree, and credentials to 60% of the population by 2025. So to go to Marcy's question, I mean, I think here and in this community, we're seeing a lot of us are agreeing with what Marcy is saying. But is that what the statewide, what people are saying, or are they just looking at it? That degree or that well, I agree 100% that there are things besides degrees that are important measures of success. I'll stipulate that up front. What I'm going to do, I'm going to share with you some slides from Dwayne Matthews with the Lumina Foundation that I think are very tough to refute that, yes, there are things besides credentials that matter, but if we don't pay close attention to credentials, we're failing our students. Marcy? I would love to see us increase to 60%. I don't have a problem with that, but I have a worry that it's going to lead to great inflation. And honestly, I don't think we'd have student learning outcomes if we had if we had dealt with great inflation 20 years ago. So um, I, I'm really worried Dumbing about Dumbing down the need. curriculum just to get graduates. Another legitimate yeah. concern. Yeah. We're going to talk about you. Did, did you get ahead of me. We got the, the information on that. Another question. We're we'll talking about where we are now. What's the percentage now? Same question. We'll show you in a second. David? Is it just my memory or did Bill Gates ever finish college? <laughs> 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 Melinda did. She's a Duke, Duke graduate. Uh, Michael Dell didn't complete college. Shaquille O'Neal did not. I don't know if Barbara Streisand did. There are exceptions to completion. Steve Jobs, another slacker. <laughs> Joseph, go ahead. Yes, I was just wondering what institution would advertise as a low quality degree. <laughs> In the United States, let me see if I can quickly break down the different colors of the dots. 25 to 34, the youngest cohort is the blue dot, the red dot 35 to 44, the yellow dot 45 to 64. So this is showing a lot of data on one slide. So the United States, if you can't see, on the whole continuum in terms of degrees is somewhere here. So we're not Turkey, we're not Korea, we're not the best, we're not the worst. And if you look at the red dot, 35 to 40 in some areas we're doing, as well as anyone in the world, where we want to focus is on the younger cohort group, which is 25 to 34. This is another way of looking at the world. So how there is the United States, 42%. So the first question, how are we doing in the United States, 42%. Of uh, students, 20, uh, uh, not students, of, of people in the age group 25 to 34 have some meaningful degree within the Lumina definition. Okay, you want to see where California fits? So wait for it, 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 there we are. Okay. So 38% statewide, 25 to 34 year olds, and we've talked about this point before. For most of us in this room, California does fairly well. If you're 65 or above, California does great. 25 to 34, the future of the economy, the future of our state, not so much. Okay. Anybody have questions about it? Pretty powerful slide. Yes. George Lipsitz argues that uh, California's education is now Mississippi of the 50s. Well, let's take a look. Arkansas is 26%. California is 38. No. Mississippi, is 30. Mississippi, Arkansas, and it's not where we want to be. Right? 34. Stipulate again. This is not the only measure of success. It's a pretty damn important one, isn't it? Yes. yes? of higher education? I, I don't know the answer, but I, I bet the answer is that California has a very high percentage of population in book and book enrolled in higher education because community colleges are enroll over 2.7. So I think her question, if I understand it, is are there other colleges that have more opportunities? I don't think so. I don't think that's the problem in other states. So maybe some good news. Santa Cruz, we're in the top 10 counties. Okay. 
at 42%, really nothing to write home about, but that gets you in the top 10% in California counties. And if we want to feel a little better, there's the bottom 10% where Glenn, Lasso, and Madera, they're down in Arkansas territory. <laughs> well, let's take a look compared to the world. So we're in the top 10 in California, which unfortunately places us right about the middle nationally. So being in the best in California, in this instance, doesn't really put you where you need to be. Okay. So why does it matter? Now we've all seen charts like this. This would be a great one again. I would be showing my students this on day one, I think, very quickly, that maybe you don't want to be in algebra, maybe you don't want to be in maybe political science or business law that I thought you don't want to be here. But here's a really good reason why. That if you drop out of high school, here you go. You're going to be poor, period. Unless you happen to be, well, Bill Gates graduated from high school, so even Gates fell jobs, you know, and let's be realistic, these are guys who blew through Harvard and places like that in three years and the university didn't have much else to offer them. They, they're not typical, they're outliers. High school, you're going to do better off. An associate's degree, you're doing substantially better. A bachelor's degree, and if you have a master's, master's degree or beyond, your life is very different. Now, that doesn't mean that we're factories all about making people wealthy, but Helping people avoid poverty, I think, is, is at a core of what we do. So, I mean, look at that. Degrees do matter. They're not all that matter, but degrees matter very much. This one really jumped out at me. If you're a high school dropout, and these numbers are now 2008, so I haven't seen more recent numbers, but I would strongly suggest that the proportions haven't changed much. If you're a high school dropout, the chance of being unemployed is higher. If you have a master's or above, I bet that hasn't moved very much. So having a master's degree doesn't guarantee that you're immune from a really tough economy, but it inoculates you fairly well compared to the high school dropout. Yes? That's everybody. Well, however, the U.S. The Department of Labor measures that employment. Well, survey of households. Survey of households. Okay. So, pretty dramatic, isn't it? The more educated you are, the less likely you are to be unemployed. It's not a guarantee, it's not a silver bullet, but the correlation is incredibly strong. This one is a little bulkier, but I think powerful again, that it's looking at unemployment in each of the, the last five recessions, including the current one. And once again, we're hitting all-time unemployment rates for high school dropouts. And if you have a bachelor's, this doesn't show beyond a bachelor's degree, but if you have a bachelor's degree, you've been in much less hard by the recession. It doesn't break out by an associate's degree in this one either, but there will be a correlation again. So tough economic times, having that credential is really important. Now, earlier I mentioned the fact, really disturbing, that if you've lost your job, the chances of that job coming back are, best in, are less than 50-50 nationally. So in other recessions, the jobs there's been some job elimination. Now we're in all the cliches are true, a new economy. So if you lose your job now, if you don't come back and, and gain a meaningful credential, you're basically destined to be the working poor. And this is a powerful slide. This is from USA Today, that the high-skilled jobs are growing. The middle-skilled jobs are going away. So I want to be just as straightforward as I can. We're on the front lines between our students being destined to stuck in the work, being stuck in the working poor, or middle class or better. And the main difference between being working poor and being middle class, and hopefully beyond that for many of our students, is the educational services we provide. Once again, credentials, degrees are not the only measure. They are just perhaps the most important measure and predictor of how our students are going to do in life. So statewide again for California, the challenge we face. The new jobs, 1.3 million for high school graduates and dropouts, I mean for, uh, for post-secondary, and only 614,000 jobs for high school dropouts and graduates. So if you don't have the credential beyond high school, you're going to be working more. Unless you're, you're the exceptions, if you, we, the, the NBA player goes straight from high school to the NBA, then the odds of that are about you know, 1 in 50 million. There aren't many of those. And for California, there are going to be new jobs. And 3.3 million of the new jobs will be for those with post-secondary credentials. 
1.2 for high school graduates and a million for high school dropouts. And if you would chart the income for those various jobs, it's going to very closely track the education as well. <coughs> education and income are going to correlate very closely. So statewide for California, the current number of college graduates were at 38.6% statewide, that big gap between this big goal of 60% that Lumina and Gates and and, it, and I don't want to just pin this on the foundations. The President of the United States has adopted the same ambitious goals for college completion. Uh, and the state of California is going to be looking very closely at what we're doing in terms of uh, providing uh, students who are graduating. So the additional degrees, 4.7 million, that's 255 more a year than we're producing now. Now let's in inject a note of reality here. How do you do that at the same time when the budgets are being cut at every level? Really tough, increasing. So the annual increase, 34,000 a year. We could back out at some level what the real share of that would be. It's quite deep. This chart, also very interesting to me, that 4.4 million have attended college but don't have a degree. Okay? So you look, pretty big piece of the pie. And I don't know what the numbers are in Santa Cruz County, but I will by the end of the spring. How many students? have attended some college in Santa Cruz County that have not completed a degree, because that would be a prime area for us to, to perhaps focus, to help the students who have started and stopped out for some reason to come back and, and, and make that journey from the working poor to the middle class or better. Because those with some college and no degree, they're a little better off than high school dropout. Maybe quite a bit better off, but not nearly as much better off as they could be by completing a college degree. So, if you look around the room, we have a large percentage of us here who have a, a graduate or professional degree. Statewide, that puts us in a pretty small piece of the pie. And we need to remember that, that not everybody in the world has a master's degree or a doctorate. It's about 10% of the people in California. And about 19% have less than high school. So the high school dropout rate is something to keep in mind. Uh, yes. By the way, sure. Don't look at the colors there. That's right. The numbers, <laughs> the 18.7 percent, that little sliver of blue, yep. that's and the 20 percent, the big sliver of red, are about the same size. Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit. That's a little bit misleading. Yeah, right. That is misleading. So, so uh, let me go ahead. Wow. I was going to say, like I've stolen these slides from Dwayne Matthews of Luna, so. He's correct that the, the pieces of the pie on that slide are not. It's a good thing they're in charge. Yeah. Pay hey, no attention to the man behind the pie slides. <laughs> so I sense some cynicism that you're using. David? Some of this is about to change, but for years we argued in the faculty senate that a person. Uh, who leaves this college with a transfer at junior level who does not apply for a degree doesn't is, is in that green category at the bottom. Yeah. Is that a problem with no degree? Okay. Yeah. David's point and is a student who successfully transfers but doesn't receive an associate's degree would be whatever the proportions, and your point's well taken that the slide should reflect correctly what the percentages are. That they're not, they wouldn't be counted as a success necessarily. Part of what's changing is the transfer degree law, SB 171440, will will be an incentive for students to complete an associate's degree before they transfer by guaranteeing admission in the CSU. Craig, you got a comment? Yeah, some college no degree in Santa Cruz County is 23 percent. Okay, 20, which is pretty close. Pretty close to the statewide yeah. Alex? Um, there's a slide you showed for just a second before you got to this one to define uh, high quality degree work. Yes. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Just okay, sure. Okay. That's a new time. Oh, sure. Point would be included in that, and the employment point. 
would be included. Now, this isn't Cabrillo's definition. This may not be the right definition, but I would suggest it's a pretty provocative point to start at what we think matters in terms of degrees. And again, this is one measurement of many of success, but an important one. And uh, this slide shows kind of a disturbing trend that the purple line is more people thinking the college is necessary, and the green line going down is whether people think qualified students have the opportunity to go to college as prices go up, as seats in colleges are going down. So at a time when more and more people are recognizing the importance of uh, college education and a degree, the opportunity is going down. Those are perceptions, yes. Any questions? Is it, is it possible uh, on the state level to uh, include in the discussion exactly the category that uh, I don't know who talked about it before up there? The people who complete transfer but don't go on to a bachelor's degree. I mean, if, we, if we're going to be measured uh, and in some sense perhaps funded by that kind of completion rate. We need to track it. We do. I, I yeah. agree. Yeah. And I think if the yeah. state, Chancellor Jack Scott has a task force on student success, mm -hmm. and they'll be looking at these really hard questions. How do you measure successes? <clears throat> because degrees and certificates alone are an inadequate view of the total impact community colleges have. Transfers are important. I think my, my real point was that you have to petition to get a degree. Mm -hmm. You don't bother to teach you don't get your degree even though you Well, there are colleges who have gone back and looked at students who had enough credits for a degree and awarded one whether they petitioned or not. Nothing forbids you from doing that. That's my point. We should, yeah. uh, we should, okay. uh, we should go back. Now, David's point is if students qualify for a degree, why wait till they necessarily apply? For, for as long as I've been at Cabrillo, I don't understand why, but talking to students, I started at Cabrillo in 93. The entire time I've been here, I've known students who did not want to get and associates degree, they thought that somehow having that on their transcript looked bad. Well, that's a communication problem to address. I've right? never understood why. Right? Well, our, uh, our time is winding down, and some of you have to go to other meetings immediately after this. A quick look at degrees. This is AA and AS degrees in the last three years, and I'll be the first to confess, I had to go to the fact book to have any idea what our totals work, so I don't expect it to be common knowledge, but I think it is something we need to be looking at what our trends are. So we had a bit of a dip in 08, 09, and 09, 010, 905 degrees. I'm just sharing that with you, I don't know, <coughs> don't have any conclusions. This year, who knows what our total will be. Certificates, 149, 189, 145 in the last three years. Again, just sharing that with you, not with any judgment one way or another. So the culture of evidence, we need to look critically. If a, if a pie chart has the wrong proportion on the graph, we can talk about that and, and be consistent in the, in the information that we're communicating. Uh, so we need to be looking at evidence in making our decisions. And what can we do? We need to be nurturing an environment where it's safe and necessary to engage in courageous conversations. Talking about degrees and whether we should make that an emphasis or not is itself a courageous conversation because not everyone will agree. But equity and student success have to be at the heart of what we're doing and looking at how different groups are performing, some better than others. And the faculty senate team Hodges is here and is leading the dialogue about student success at Cabrillo at the end of the semester last year, uh, last semester, a wonderful discussion about many of these different topics. And if we are going to have a significant impact on improving the outcomes for our students, our faculty are the leaders in doing that, and you're essential to making sure that we get where we need to be. Now, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> Our work on Friday, and uh, this past Friday afternoon, and to focus on some of the ideas that our board members wanted to discuss from the League Legislative Conference in Sacramento. And uh, Paul talked about fencing. You want to share the experience? When you learn to fence, you spend a lot of time preparing before you ever get to stab somebody, which is really what you want to do. So <laughs> you spend weeks training and never get a chance to stab someone. First week you do it. Even though you want to the first the first two weeks you spend learning to go forward and back, just stepping forward and backwards, and you don't get the weapon on the sword. Um, for about four 
probably until about four or five weeks into it, then you're still just holding it by itself. Or what do you call the weapon? I, I looked on Google and I think oh, yeah. there's one there for you. So the point Paul was making track is why data is important. There are a lot of good ideas out there. At some point, you need to pick up whatever the instrument is and get busy. And I wanted to share one final slide with you. This is, I, uh, was shared with me by Andy Goodman, who is a wonderful presenter. And he works with education quite a bit. He helps fun with us a little bit how we sometimes do things. So take a minute. If one of our committees had developed a slogan for Nike, might it look like this? <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose the challenge would be in Rio, let's just do it this semester. Let's keep the conversation going on, but also pick up the tool and stab somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for starting.